Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. He says, Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of His good pleasure. Do all things without murmurings and disputing, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not done in vain, neither labored in vain. I just want to uh, talk about that portion. It was a blessing to me. Um, reading first in that chapter, which I didn't read out to you now, about the obedience of our Lord Jesus, uh, who is our example, who is our forerunner, who is our Lord and our Master, in whose footsteps we follow. And it says of him that uh, although he was in the form of God and he was equal with God, he humbled himself and actually made himself of no reputation. He, he took off his, his divinity, if you can, his majesty, his glory, his um, powers, as it were, that were in, in him as God the Son. He laid And he took on flesh and blood, and uh, and even obedient to the of even while I'm not present here, you be obedient to the Lord, even as Christ your Lord was obedient to his Father. You also humble yourself and obey even to the death of the cross, as your Lord even did. You know um, the. The death of the cross to me speaks of taking up the cross of Christ myself. Um, as I obey, it's not a, uh, a law that I obey. It's not an old covenant. It's not a set of rules that we are under. But as we follow Jesus, there will be a cross. It's the, the consequences of having the testimony of Jesus in your life and loving the Word of God and walking in it. Those consequences, we can just say it's the cross of Jesus, the shame of Christ that we will bear as we obey. Um, and so Paul now says to them, to the Philippians, as you've obeyed in my presence, obey the Lord in my absence as well, and work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Um, It's impressive to me that he says it's your own salvation. Think about that for a moment. He doesn't there say, work out this great salvation. Work out this thing that God has done out there in Calvary. He says, work out your own salvation. It speaks of a very personal thing. It's a personal, individual experience. <coughs> and... Um, for each and every one of us, you know, you can only so long um, ride on the faith of maybe your parents or, or someone who's been before you in the Lord who's given you the bottle to drink of. But really, it's your own salvation that you need to see outwork in your life. Um, and the starting point is obviously to say, and I think for most of us, it's clear, I don't need to preach much about this, but we, is it your own salvation here? That'll be point number one, if I had a different crowd here. Um, have you personally enjoyed salvation? Are you sure that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life? Do you have peace with God? Or are you still living uh, with a guilty conscience, with the uncertainty of what will happen if, I, if my life is taken from me unexpectedly, and I have to stand before the Lord? Is there still an uncertainty? 
because that's not the place to be. God has paid for full salvation on Calvary. He said it is finished. And what needed to be done, what the law required for sinners like you and me, Christ fulfilled as he gave his life as a ransom for us. And so um, God wants to bring us first into a place of experiencing our own salvation. Your own, your very own. Um, and you know, when, when you think of where we each came from, we each had different experiences, we had different families, we grew up in, uh, we struggled with different things maybe in life. Um, your Goliath is not the same as my Goliath, etc., etc. Your skeletons in your closets have different names than mine does. And, but God has tailored salvation for you as an individual. Isn't that amazing? I'm rejoicing a bit about the thought of it. Because didn't He form me while I was in my mother's womb? Doesn't He see my going out and my coming in? All my ways are open before Him. Doesn't He know my thoughts are far off? Even before I can speak, He knows what's going to come out. He, he knows my circumstances that I face and, and the, the difficulties in life that I go through. He knows all those things. And He has tailored salvation to be sufficient for you. The scripture says he's able to save to the uttermost them that come to God by him. So he wants to be a very private and personal and individual savior for you. That's wonderful. There's, there is no nothing within me or without that can or should keep me from entering into the kingdom of heaven because Christ the Savior has tailored salvation for you. Um, now why, why these words, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling? Work out, it's not working for, eh? so it's not working for your own salvation with fear and trembling. There are some who want to work for salvation and they live a miserable life because they're always working so hard and so charitable and so trying to be so goody goody but ever so often failing and falling flat on their face realizing that they just can't meet up with God and his holiness and his righteousness so it's not working for our own salvation but God has done a work and he's performed by his spirit he's done a work of regeneration in our hearts. He's, he's given us the rebirth by Jesus Christ. So we are born of His Spirit. It's His work, not ours. But it needs to be worked out with fear and trembling nogal. Met vrees en beving, sê die Afrikaans. Jou eie huil, werk uit jou eie huil met vrees en beving. Why fear and trembling? I was wondering about this. Why, why must there be these words about working out your own salvation with fear and trembling? And um, what I, as as I looked to the Lord and I thought about this, um, the story of Jacob came up to me, where Jacob goes to sleep. Um, he he's now been sent away by his mom and dad to go and find a wife uh, with Laban. Um, he's actually also running away from Esau who still wants to kill him. Um, and it is in is it now? Genesis I think it's 18. Am I confused? Let me see. No, not 18, it's a bit further. Uh, Genesis 28. In Genesis 28, there's that story um, where Jacob flees and in verse 10, and Jacob went out from Beersheba and went to Haran and he lighted upon a certain place you, you light off a camel or you light off a horse. He, he got off and he, and he got got off in a certain place and he tarried there all night 
because the sun was set. And he took of the stones of that place and put them for his pillows and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father, and the God of Isaac. The land whereon thou liest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north and south. And in thee, and in thy seed, shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Um, and behold, I am with thee, and will keep thee, in all places whither thou goest, and will bring thee again into this land, for I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. What a wonderful promise. God confirming what he said to Abraham, in you all the nations of the earth be blessed and in your seed. And I will give you this land of promise as an inheritance to the north, south, east and west. And wherever you travel, I will keep you. I will keep you and I will be with you until I bring you into this land of which I've spoken. It's very much like this great salvation which has come to us in Jesus' name. Because he who begun a good work in us will complete it. He will perfect it. And we read in that verse in Philippians, it is he that works in us to will and to do according to his good pleasure. So. Another scripture says, of him are you in Christ Jesus. So it is of God choosing. Folks. It's because God so loved the world that there is a Savior, that there is a, a great salvation to be preached and to be spoken of. It is God first, then me. If, if he didn't reveal himself to me, I was dead in my sin. How could I ever see or respond? If he didn't give me speak the word of life into me? How could my spirit live and respond to God? It is God first. He began this good work. And He's going to see it through. Similar to this promise that He says to Jacob here. <clears throat> I brought you out. I'm showing you this great land. I'll bless you and make your seed to fill the earth. And I'll bring you in. And wherever we go, I'll be with you. It's a wonderful promise, not just of a start, but of a continuation. Our God's going to be with us and bring us into His promise. And for us, there's a promise of the kingdom of our Father. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you, that where I am, you may be also. There's a place for us in the Father's house that He's gone to prepare. Um, there's a city adorned by God. There's a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. And there's a thousand years going to happen before that where the saints will reign and rule with Jesus. These are glorious hopes that we look forward to. They cannot be compared to this world and, and the things that we go through down here. <clears throat> Wonderful promise. Verse 16. And Jacob awake out of his sleep and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. And he was afraid, and said, How dreadful is this place! This is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. See how the, how the fear of God came upon Jacob there. The dread of the awesomeness of God came upon him as he woke from his sleep realizing that he's just had a vision and a revelation of God, of the heavens open. Sorry, he didn't say the heavens open. He just saw a ladder set up on earth, and the top of it reached right into heaven. God standing at the top, speaking to him, and angels of God ascending and descending. It's a wonderful picture of, um, in the Old Covenant, it came, the, the, the law was given by the mediation of angels. So angels mediated lots between God and man. I think today still they do. 
we may be not so aware of them and we don't have so many accounts of them, but um, the, the work and the ministry of angels have not been switched off. It's just been fulfilled, I think, in the Lord Jesus that the things that they bring to us now are not things of the law, but they are of grace and truth, the things of Christ. Um, but Jacob realizes that this encounter is an encounter with God. And he calls that place the house of God. He calls it the, the gate to heaven. It's like he's stumbled upon the gate to heaven. A secret pathway. A meeting with God. You know, you and I have stumbled upon the Lord Jesus. Not as though we were looking for him. He came and he looked for us. Isn't it so? If you think of your own experience, were you looking and searching? Probably not. It was just God who made himself known at a particular time and place to us. And it's as though we've stumbled on the gate of heaven. And he's brought us in to the house of God. What, what does Jacob do to his pillows then? Verse 18, And Jacob rose up early in the morning, and he took the stone that he had put for his pillows, and he set it up for a pillar, and he poured oil upon the top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel, which means house of God. Verse 20, And Jacob vowed a vow, saying that if God keeps me and brings me back to this place, um, then I will call, then this place will be the house of God, and I will give a tithe of everything to the Lord. And then in verse, in chapter 35, I think it is, um, he comes back to that place. Yeah. And he makes, the Lord calls him to come back, to move back actually to Bethel, and to dwell there, to go and live there and to make an altar unto God there. So it's a wonderful progression in this man's life. First he's found to be a sleeper. He sleeps on, on his pillows of stone. And he just happened to sleep in the right place, it almost seems. And weren't we sleeping, in a sense? We were fast asleep, merely going on our merry, wicked ways. Each man doing his own thing, doing what we thought was right in our own eyes. Wasn't it so? We were like sleepers, sleeping in sins and trespasses, sleeping in our ignorance, in the foolishness of our hearts. We were asleep. And God comes and He reveals Himself to us. It's as though He appears to us. Hasn't the, the grace of our Lord Jesus appeared unto all men, the Scripture says? Uh, Titus chapter 2. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us, denying ungodliness and worldly lust. The next chapter, chapter 3, talks about, but when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, like, voila! It's just there. You are merrily sleeping on. And the grace of God appeared in your life. And it's as though God revealed himself to me. And just, I don't know how or what, but the, a spark of faith came into my heart. And, and I responded. I was made alive unto God. And I met with Jesus as my own personal Savior. You with me? Am I still sleeping now? No. I've woken from my sleep. I'm alive from my sins and my trespasses. And my pillow becomes a monument in my life. He erects that pillow as a, as a stone. It's like a monument. It's like a testimony that he erected there to remind him that this is the place where he discovered the gate of heaven. This is the place where he entered into the house of God. This is the place where my own salvation began. And he anoints that pillar. And he says, this place will never be the same. I'm going to change the name. It's not Luz anymore. It's Beth El, the house of God. That change needs to take place in every single one of us to be able to say, I'm going to work out my own salvation. Your pillow needs to turn into a pillar. 
and your, your condition of being asleep in your own way, oblivious of God's purpose and God's call, suddenly you're awakened and you're made alive unto God. And there's this monument of a day and a time and a place that stands in your life to which you can take others to in your conversations and your testimonies and say, I want to take you to my pillow who became a stone and tell you about this pillar, this time when I met with Jesus and when He changed everything, when I became a new creature. The sons of God, you see. You've become the sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and a perverse generation. We were sleeping amongst those who were crooked and who were perverse. Some of us were very religious, others less. Some of us had good manners, others I could swear like a matru. Um, but God changed everything. And, and there's this monument of being born again in my life. But God takes Jacob on and as he seeks God, as he trusts in God, uh, he works for Laban. You remember the story? He gets two wives instead of one. Um, he he w works w w while the sun is beating down on him and it's cold at night. He's working, he's trusting God. In the end, God takes him out there and he's rich with flocks and herds and all sorts of stuff as he travels back. But there comes a time where God says, now nah, come on. You're going to move back to Bethel and dwell there in the house of God. And, and there, his pillar becomes an altar where he worships. An altar speaks of worship, doesn't it? It speaks also of sacrifice. And for us to see this progression and to see it in my own life, because remember the scripture that we read is, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Is, is this very personal salvation, is it real still in your life? Or has it fallen asleep again? Has your pillar gone and turned into a pillow again? Where are you, Adam? Where are you? Are you fast asleep in the boat again? Gone horizontal? Or is this thing still standing upright, anointed with the Spirit of God in your life? God wants your salvation to be outworked, further outworked, not just begun, but outworked in your life, and that with fear and trembling. You know, with fear and trembling, we're all going to stand before a judgment seat of Christ one day. It's a reality, folks. Every single one will give an account of himself. Of himself. Yeah, but what about so-and-so? That's going to teach you. That's not going to feature. Lord, but you know what he did to me. It's not going to feature. You know, Lord, what all the rubbish they taught to me. It's not going to feature. You've got the word of God. Can you read? Yes, you can. Uh, did you get light from the Lord Jesus? Because he's the true light. Has he, has he lit you up? The, and you can read? Then the Holy Ghost is there to show you and teach you everything so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped and prepared for every good work. It's all there. And you and I will stand before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account of himself, of myself, to God. And then our works will be judged so as through fire to see of what sort of it is. And, and there should be a fear of God and a trembling and an awe and a dread for the Lord and for this if I see the, the, the awesome investment that he made on Calvary when he gave his only begotten son to die, then he must be looking for an awesome, an equally awesome return on investment. And, and he's come to do an awesome work in us, folks. Not for us to go fall asleep again on our little pillows but to go on and progress from having this monument of a, of a born-again experience to come to a place where we live in the house of God. We dwell 
in Bethel. In Him we live and move and have our being, and more particularly in the body of Christ. Isn't that Him here on earth? So in the Lord Jesus and in His church, we live and move and have our being. And we, have, we, we express our love for Him. We express our worship. We bring our gifts to Him. Isn't that so? It's in the house of God. There's the altar. There's the place of sacrifice, of laying down your life, of being obedient and taking on the form of a servant like the Lord Jesus did. And taking up the cross, and saying, Lord, the cross, I'll cling to that cross, that rugged cross, and I will lay down my life for you as you did for me. He wants to bring us into the house of God and cause us to dwell there. Don't we sometimes revert back to our old ways when it comes to thinking about meeting and church? Huh? Just hear yourself speak sometimes that, you know, we're going to church. Or, yeah, but at church they say this and that. Or at church we do this and that. He is the church. The Lord Jesus. It's His body. It's made up of living members. And we've been added to Him, baptized into one body, baptized into Jesus. And so my, my existence is now in relation to the body of Christ. And this is my Aram. My arm existence is in relation to the rest of my body. And it's, it's in connection with my brain. And it's there to serve me, to feed me, and to wash me, and to whatever, protect me. My arm is getting instructions from my brain, but it serves the whole body. And so you and I have been fitted together to the body of Christ. And we've been brought back to the place where this is where we dwell. It's not about coming together for meetings and um, attending meetings and at the church, but to have this knowledge that I'm part of the work of God in Durbanville. I'm, I've been brought, brought into the fellowship of the Spirit with believers in Durbanville. And this is where there's an altar. This is where I bring my gifts, not just my attendance, but I bring my full offering to the Lord. And so is there fear and a trembling? Is salvation being worked out in our lives? I want to go back to Philippians. It is God which works in you both to will and to do of His good pleasure. Just as God is working in us, you know what? Satan also wants to work in us. So you know that, eh? Scripture says he walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And being the father of lies, he's looking for, for a gap. He's looking for an opportunity where you and I will give place to the devil. Where, where we will um, entertain the flesh and allow Satan to sow his lies into our hearts. And those lies turn into thoughts, those thoughts turn into desires. Those desires eventually, when fully grown, they, give, they become sin in our life. If not rooted out early. And sin, when it is fully grown, it brings forth death. So, you think God is working in us to will and to do. Let's not be deceived. Satan is also working. He's not idle. He goes about seeking, seeking opportunity, seeking whom he may devour. And he's got access to our devices. He's got access to our iPads and our televisions. He's got access to us through so many avenues where he seeks to steal our time, where he seeks to steal our um, desire to worship God as we stimulate the flesh. Doesn't our desire to worship God just go down? You feed the flesh with the fuel that it wants and you're feeding the old man and it becomes stronger and stronger and the spirit becomes 
weaker and weaker. It's a similar um, thing that Jesus described there in the garden where he prayed and the disciples were just there praying. And the three were just here. And he was just there. And he was praying and he came to them and they fell asleep. And he says, can't you just watch and pray an hour with me? Yeah, we try and all you know, you know, they fall asleep again. I do that too, you know. I've got a little scarf fallacy that I pray on, and um, I'm there on my knees, and I'm praying and worshiping, and the next moment I like wake up. I'm like, what? Five minutes have gone by, and I was I don't know where I, was, I fell asleep. <laughs> it happens to us, and Jesus said to them, "The Spirit is willing. The Spirit wants to worship and pray." The flesh is weak. You know what? As we we can either feed the flesh through all that stimulates our lust, our desires, and some lust of the things and pretty things, other lust of the flesh, other lust of the ego kind of centric stuff. And we can feed those things. And in the meanwhile, the spirit grows weaker and weaker and weaker. Because the spirit lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth, mouth of God. Every word that comes from the mouth of God feeds my spirit, makes it stronger. You see those endurance athletes, they drink those tins of powdery stuff. And they become stronger and they exercise more. And then after the exercise, look, 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 look. And they become stronger and they exercise more. They're training their bodies. They're feeding and, and, and giving it all the nutrients to build and to replenish. Build and replenish. And then they exercise and they go out for another workout. We know these terms. We, we, in the society, we've got to work out, you know. And we know what to do to have a good workout. It's the same in the spirit. When we go on our knees and we prayerfully read the Word of God. Your spirit is having a workout. And you're drinking to replenish and to build. To replenish and to build. And you're starving the flesh. There's another way to starve the flesh and to put it in its place. Not a very pleasant one, is it? Fasting. Because your belly threatens to be your God. For all of us. And he talks about those whose God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame, uh, whose end is destruction, who walk as the enemies of the cross of Christ. He talks about believers, those who preach the gospel as some to be such, who walk as the enemies of the cross of Christ. Their belly is their God. So, in other words, what they, uh, they serve in the gospel to consume it on their flesh. All they're in for is for the profit, or for the glory, or for the fame, or for the pulpit, or whatever. They're in it for the flesh. And when we fast, we say to the flesh, you are put under. You're under discipline. I'm starving you, and I'm strengthening the spirit. So when we pray, and when we spend time with Jesus, and in, in the word of God, my spirit is edified. When I pray in tongues, my understanding is unfruitful, but my spirit is edified. The scripture says. Um, all these things is to strengthen my spirit. So God wants to work in us to will and to do. To will means to have the desire to perform, to have a godly desire, a desire to do the will of God, a desire to fulfill His call on my life. And he's also working in me to do. Isn't that wonderful? So he doesn't just leave me and wish me well. He says, come on, this desire, I'm going to put it in there. I'm going to put it in there. You just blow over it a bit. And you just encourage it a bit as you read the Word of God. And you meditate on the Scriptures. And you give yourself entirely to it. You just see how God puts those godly desires the, even the mind of Christ will put it in your heart to do, to go and do. And he says, now that you're going, now that you've made up your mind and you're starting to move, I'll be with you. And I'll work in you not just to will, but to do, 
to perform that which I put in your heart to do. So, so that none of us can say it is of my own will, my own desire, my own ability to run, but it is God who works in me. So let's not be fooled. The devil is also wanting to work in your life and in mine. He's wanting to uh, sow in your heart to strengthen the flesh, the carnal man. And as, that, as you allow that to happen, really now that we're born again, we've got to say, we don't have to be the slaves of those things anymore. We've got to say, because our body has now become the temple of God. It's already, it's redeemed, it's bought with a price, it's washed by the blood, it's His. It's indwelt by His Spirit. Who are you going to yield yourself to now? Are you going to yield yourself to the flesh? To indulge in the desires of the flesh? Or are you going to yield your members as instruments to God? Instruments of righteousness? Because God wants to work in us. Ultimately, He's making us and, and showing us to the world to be the sons of God. The sons of God. Blameless and harmless. Doing all things without murmuring and disputing. Maybe the kinders met the dene hoor. Doen alles sonder om te murmureer en sonder feestpraat. Dit is hier in Afrikaan. Moe nie klaar nie. Moe nie mou nie. Doen alles. Alles wat die keizer jou vraag. Alles wat jou ma en jou pa jou vraag. Sonder om te mou. Doe dit net in die vrees van God. So what? As het nie jou beerd was nou nie. So what? Doe dit net in die vrees van God. That you may be blameless and harmless as the sons of God in the midst of a crooked and a perverse generation. Ja. Ek heer, ek het nie meer sy sy myl op my gehad. Ja. 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 The clip um, that uh, Aniska sent me was about um, obeying your parents in everything. Um, yeah, but children said it, yeah, it was wonderful. Um, the same for us. We are the sons of God, so we've got parents. He's our Father, our Father in heaven. And as we obey Him without complaining, um, we stand out amongst a crooked and a perverse generation. We stand out as the sons of God. Um, is your salvation being worked out still? Or are you going horizontal? My first question. Has your pillar fallen over in your life and become a pillow again? And you pass the feet. No drive, no desire for the Lord Jesus. There should be in us a, a hunger and a thirst after God to be in His presence. There should be in us a yearning to bear fruit. You know those ladies in the Bible who couldn't have kids? They were sad. Eh? They were in agony. Hannah was crying to have a child. And eventually she sought the Lord and He gave her Samuel, who she gave back to the Lord. They were in agony over their barrenness. Are you and I fussed about not having kids in Christ? We should be very strict and very serious about bearing children for the Lord. Very serious. And we should be even more serious about what becomes of them. Paul writes to the Philippians and he says, My joy is going to be full if you obey even in my absence. Um, John writes in the second and the third epistle of John, he says, I've got no greater joy than, my, than to know that my children are walking in truth. He's not talking about his blood kids. He's talking about those he fathered in the Lord. We must agonize over our barrenness. Agonize over our unfruitfulness. Agonize over my ministry. Is it coming to maturity? Is it bearing fruit yet? And then those who come into the fold because of my testimony, I should be agonizing in prayer over them. Oh Lord, that they may 
approve the things that are excellent, that they may be grounded in truth, that my children may walk in truth, Lord Jesus, that they may grow in grace. Because one day when we appear before the Lord, isn't that going to be our crown and our rejoicing? Even those whom we brought to the Lord Jesus or called for in Christ. So folks, there is fear and trembling in my heart. If I consider the greatness of the salvation that has come to me and the price that was paid to save my soul, there's a fear and a trembling on my part to, to respond properly to that. To see that it has a full outworking in my life. And that my, my pillar never becomes my pillar again. Amen. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you, Lord, that as children of God, you don't leave us comfortless. But Lord, your word is a is like a rod and a staff. And Lord, you bring correction and instruction to those whom you love. In fact, your word says, if we are without correction, we don't belong to you. So Lord, if I have heard some correction or some instruction or some encouragement this morning, Lord, we rejoice because we know that we are still the sons of God. Father, what's behind and what's done can never be changed. We forget those things which are behind. But Lord, this morning, this morning, Lord, let it be like another monument in our life where we make a monumental decision to reach forward, reach toward the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Father, help us to, to do that and to lay off the sins and the weight that ensnare us and to run this race, Lord, with endurance. Be with us, Lord Jesus. Look upon this little flock that we are and bring us all to a place of fruitfulness, Lord Jesus. Each and every one of us to, to a place of, uh, with a glorious liberty, sharing the testimony of Jesus with others, Lord. Unashamed of the name of Jesus because He's not ashamed to call us his brethren. Help us, Lord. Let your spirit be upon us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.